Hey, welcome to my coffee booth at Felton Heights Flea Market. Just a second, I need to add the finishing touches to this latte. Perfect. Guys, try this. It's the special drink that I came up with for our two-month anniversary, which, FYI, is today. How romantic. What's the name of this drink? I think Patrick should name it. We can call that Paige's Vom. You know, because it reminds me of when we were five and you threw up in the back of my mom's car during our road trip. <laughs> Stop! I'm not kidding! Me neither! It's one of my favorite memories, as that's when I fell deeply in love with you. Or how about, why is everything a joke to you? Just leave! We're done! I'm sorry about that. Ugh, let's start over. I'm Paige, and everyone calls me Perfect Paige, because, well, everything about me is perfect. That must be thanks to my parents. My dad's a hospital director, and my mom's a university president. They both excel in their jobs, juggle family affairs, never quarrel, and always have smiles on their faces. And me, I'm beautiful, smart, and have some talents, such as making drinks. My dream is to run my own coffee shop. On the side of the dream job at the national TV station that I will definitely get, then I'll come home to my dream boyfriend who's a flawless man that I can count on. And we'll have a perfect love story like my parents. Then why did I choose that funny guy as my boyfriend, you ask? Ugh. Before he became my now ex, Patrick was a close friend since childhood. We lived in the same neighborhood, and... It was my friend Doris's birthday, but she came up with a stupid condition that all the girls had to bring along a boy. Ugh, please. This sounded ridiculous, so I presumed it was a joke and showed up alone. Only everyone else had a plus one with them. Paige, you need to stop being so picky and give a guy a chance. How about your bestie Patrick? He's nice, smart, great at basketball, and he's pretty cute, right? No, 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 we go way back. He's all right, I guess, but that's not enough. I, there's no one on this planet who can reach your ridiculously high standards. He's the best you're gonna get, and look, he's also so funny. Patrick's sense of humor is by far his most infuriating trait. Fine, perfect page. You'll just have to show up to the prom alone then. And I doubt that's a perfect thing to do. I guess Doris's words played on my mind, because when Patrick walked me home, I blurted out, Hey, if we're both single after we turn 17, then let's date. Then my perfect school year will end with a perfect prom night with my high school sweetheart, just like in a rom-com. Huh? Have you eaten too much frosting or something? No, of course not. I just can't possibly turn up to prom dateless. Oh, the outrage. As if anyone could ever dare to go to prom without a date. But I'm not just anyone. Such a humiliating thing would be a scratch on the diamond, which is me. Okay, okay. I'll do whatever you want. Time passed by and I concentrated on my studies and my hobby. Then before I knew it, I turned 17 and still didn't have a boyfriend. I heard this strange noise coming from my balcony. Patrick? What is he doing with a rose in his mouth? Hey there, do you remember our oath once upon a time? Okay, fine. From today, I allow you to be my boyfriend. Go home and get ready. Tonight will be our first date. Wait, you serious? It's not a joke. Why are you always joking? All right, all right. Where does my love want to go on our first date? So we started dating and so far so good. Seeing as he'd known me for years, he knew what I liked and what I was thinking. He never argued with me and just did what I asked. And best of all, everyone complimented us and said we were a match made in heaven. There was just one problem. Patrick's sense of humor was ruining the romantic vibe. So that brings us to the present and why I ended our relationship. Later that night, Patrick called and apologized, but I confirmed that the breakup was still on as I didn't want to cause strain to our friendship. He seemed pretty surprised by this, but Patrick being Patrick, he soon made light of it. Back to the friend zone. Alrighty. So no need to pick up Paige every morning anymore. Nice. See you in math class. For some reason, I was a little sad that he'd agreed to do this so quickly, but it had just been a dumb fling anyway, right? But hang on, what about prom? I couldn't lose face with my friends, so I joined a dating app to continue the search for my Prince Charming. Ugh, too short, too nerdy, too glary. And after days of desperately swiping, I finally found a guy that caught my eye. I mean, I couldn't really see his face, but he had to be hot. I messaged him right away, and you know what? We got on so well and soon arranged a date. I fixed my hair one more time and walked over to him. Hello, you. <gasps> Patrick? Surprise, my bae. I'm your perfect mystery partner. Patrick, I swear to God. How do you feel? Angry much, huh? Then now you know how my poor heart felt when you broke it to pieces. <laughs> I was fuming, but Patrick kept up his annoying grin. 
So you're that starving for love? All right, I know your ideal type way too well. Let me find you a guy. You know, attractive boys tend to hang out in a herd. We'll see. You know, being handsome is only one thing on my list. The first candidate was this guy called Beavis, the basketball team captain. We started talking, and it went well enough for him to invite me to go watch his game. He even winked at me before he scored a perfect three-pointer. All the jealous glances turned to me. Looks like Patrick really found me a good deal. At first, this was kind of cool, but soon all of the love letters and gifts Beavis received got kind of grating. Worst of all, he accepted them all. He didn't seem to be faithful at all. Also, his grades really sucked, and he was always so sweaty. This first candidate is out. Next was Daniel, a cute genius who liked to invent things. I really love how passionate he looks when he's working on something. He's so talented. But he always showed up late to our date with the excuse there was some machine malfunction. His clothes were always stained with grease, and all he talked about was research. Oh, actually, I have zero idea what you're on about. You're so robotic. I went home and already saw Patrick making himself at home in our living room. He must have heard the news. So, sporty boy has too many fangirls. No good. Mechanic boy is too busy. No good. Then maybe a rich boy with a lot of free time could treat you like a princess. Patrick introduced me to this guy called Eric, the school rich kid who showered me with lavish gifts. That was nice, but then his clinginess felt suffocating. He always seemed to be there, and he wouldn't quit calling and texting me. He also spent longer than I did getting ready. No thanks. Why? You're too clingy. If you have too much time on your hands, then why don't you go do something useful? What? I only cling on to you because I care. But I guess I was just wasting my time on useless things because you're just a stubborn, spoiled girl that finds fault in everything and doesn't appreciate other people's feelings. No one's ever spoken to me like that before. Useless? Stubborn? Spoiled? Eric's words were still echoing in my head as I walked home. Then I saw Patrick approaching. What's up? Who got you mad this time? Is it Eric? His downside is being too rich, isn't he? Not Eric, it's you. You deliberately set me up with those weirdos, didn't you? What are you saying? I only chose the guys that suit you best. No, they don't. I don't think you really understand me at all. Oh, really? How well do you understand me then? If you're that confident, then go find me an ideal girlfriend. Fine, maybe you'll quit bugging me if you're taken. Hmm, turns out trying to find a girlfriend for Patrick was trickier than I thought. He's so friendly with everyone, I actually have no idea what his type is. Whatever, he made no effort to find me a nice guy anyway, so I'll just return the favor. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, Nina, I know her, a scandalous hot girl who always goes overboard on the wax statue makeup. I'm pretty sure she likes Patrick, as she's always cheering him from the sidelines during his games. Patrick, let's see what fun date you can have with this girl. The next day, I walked straight up to Nina and asked her if she wanted to go on a date with Patrick. She looked kind of surprised, but then after thinking it over, she agreed. They met at a cafe, and after I introduced them to each other, I sat at a nearby table and observed. I expected things between them to be super awkward, but surprisingly, they seemed to get along quite well. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they kept bursting out laughing. They acted like they'd known each other for ages. Patrick and Nina bid farewell, and as soon as Nina walked away, I jumped out and asked, How can you have fun chatting with Nina all night? Don't you see her laughing out loud? That's not very ladylike. So she's fun. Everyone has flaws, though I don't even think it's a flaw. It's cute. Fine, let's see how long you two can have fun. But in the following days, I still saw Patrick with Nina. Then at school, I overheard Nina talking to her friends. Tonight? No wonder you've been looking so happy all day. Of course, it's going to be a big confession. Huh? They've only been dating for five minutes. I wonder why Patrick liked Nina that much. So I decided to stalk them. I followed them to this posh restaurant. Ugh, so humiliating. Who would have thought that Perfect Page would do something like this? But there's no way back now. They spoke for a bit, then Patrick went to answer a phone call. I thought he was going to plan his confession or something. But then, to my surprise, a man swooped in and sat down with his arm around Nina. That's Beavis! What? How could they be so shameless? I quickly ran to find Patrick, who was chilling in a corner, so I quickly pulled him back to the table. Look, you're being cheated on! Cheated on? What do you mean? The girl who's been clinging on to you for days has been flirting with your teammate. Stop playing dumb, please. Nina is just my friend. She likes Beavis, not me. Nina clearly likes you. She follows you to every game. How could she switch to Beavis out of nowhere? You should defend me, not a stranger like her. Did you forget Patrick and I are teammates? Nina was actually there for me. 
I agreed to meet Patrick just because I wanted to ask him to talk to Beavis for me. Sorry for misleading you. <laughs> What's with a bulldog's frown? We just successfully match made a couple. Let's go give the lovebird some private space. I guess you'll have to find me another girl. Don't act like we're close. I don't want a flippant and heartless friend like you. You're the heartless one. You're making a mess with your ridiculous standards and expect others to follow all of that. Then act like a victim? Don't you see how Patrick is the real casualty here? He tended to your absurd needs, even helped you get a boyfriend, yet all you do is treat him like garbage. Selfish Paige, you're not as perfect as you think. What? What do you know? You're just a plastic girl after all. Yeah, I might be plastic, but at least I realize what my flaws are to try to fix them. Unlike you, you call yourself a diamond when actually you're just a silly pebble. Was this really what people thought of me? I couldn't believe anyone would ever describe me with such ugly words. <laughs> I ran home and shut myself away in my room. It made me so distraught knowing that other people thought I was bad like that. Mom came into my room to check on me and I ended up learning everything to her. How everyone seemed to hate me now. How I might be alone for the rest of my life without finding my perfect other half and having a happy ending like mom and dad. Sweetie, everyone has flaws. I do and so does your father. I can have quite the temper, but your dad always knows what to say and do to calm me down. While he is terrible at being romantic, so I have to give him hints now and then. Point is, we accept and love each other, flaws and all. That's the secret to a long and happy marriage. Talking to mom really helped me understand that no one is perfect, and therefore my standards are unreasonable. I had some apologizing to do. I texted Beavis, Daniel, Eric, and Nina. Beavis replied straight away, telling me he was sorry too for what he said, but it came from a good place, and he's sure that I was better than that because he trusts Patrick's eye for people. Now there was just one last apology for me to make, and I needed to do this one in person. Oh, looks like he already found me. Hey, shoddy. Are you looking for me? The most handsome guy in town. Please stop. I came to talk to you about something serious. Uh, <laughs> I came to see you too. Trust me, I didn't match you with those silly guys on purpose. In no way do I want to hurt you. Because, because I like you, Paige. For real. Since when? I, I just thought we were just good friends. Since we started dating. At first, I just went along with it. But gradually, I found myself having real feelings for you. I'm so sorry for causing you trouble. Being around you makes my head fuzzy. I always crack jokes just because I want to make you smile. But turns out, you don't feel the same. I will try to keep it down from now on. No, I'm sorry too. You don't have to change anything for me. It's the real you after all. I've truly learned it now. Nobody's perfect. And it's the way people complete each other's imperfections with their personality differences that tighten the relationships. And maybe being perfect is my imperfection. So now you have my permission to offset it with your annoying unseriousness. So where were we as a couple? <laughs> oh, right. Pages vomit. Shall we go home and make that signature drink again? <laughs> Just kidding. Is it usual for you to sit on strangers the first time you meet them? This jerk. I'll show him that he's messing with the wrong girl. It's fine. Please don't hit him. Don't worry. And this is for mugging a kid. No, no, you've got it wrong. He just saved me from those muggers. And he was just teaching me how to fight back at them. Oh my, I thought it was just because the boy's bag was on the ground and that guy was holding his arm like he was about to hit him. I awkwardly stood up, literally screamed out to apologize, then ran straight home. So, as you can see, my home's a little different from the usual. My parents run a nursing home, so I grew up surrounded by the elderly. You were so embarrassed that you left him laying there and ran away? The first time I met my husband, I also knocked him over with my dolio chagi. Perhaps this boy is your destiny. Poof! No way, Mrs. Jones. Suddenly, my dad huffed past us. Oh no, I know that look. Something was bad. Lately, our finances haven't been so good. I went after him to check he was okay and found him talking to a man in the yard. On seeing me, the strange man waved me over. Do you know this person? Huh? That was the guy I almost punched earlier. That's right. The person you almost knocked out is my son. I saw everything, so I followed you here. He's got in with a bad crowd and lost focus on his studies. I want you to steer him in the right direction. I... 
I don't want to be a babysitter. I'm sorry. It's too bad about this nursing retreat, isn't it? Seems like it'll have to close soon. Although, if swayed, I don't mind being a major sponsor. <gasps> this was insane. So all I needed to do was keep an eye on his son and all the nursing home's problems would be solved? Dad said I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to. But how could I say no? Okay, I'll do it. So which school am I transferring to? Geez, everything here was so shiny. But if I had a choice, this would be the last school in town I ever wanted to attend. I entered the classroom and walked over to the only empty seat that happened to be at the back. I was about to sit down, then... Ah! Some dude pulled the chair aside and caused me to fall onto my butt. A hand appeared to pull me up, but as I went to grab it, it immediately drew back, leaving me sitting there embarrassed while everyone's laughing at me. Oops, sorry. I guess I should only give a hand when asked, right? Ugh, it was Blake. I quickly regained my cool face, sat down, and put on my headphones, pretending like I didn't hear any of those comments from other students about my rustic look. This girl seems interesting. The usual. A grand if you can win her heart in a month. Deal? Blake glanced at me and sneered at the guy. Easy. Deal. So that's how it's gonna be, is it? Luckily, I hadn't turned my music on yet, hence why I heard the whole conversation. Let me help you get some extra pocket money then, Blake. And it didn't take him long to start implementing his plan. At lunchtime, he enthusiastically led me to the canteen, guided me to get food, and even asked the lunch lady to get me an extra portion of yogurt. Nice try. I was trying to enjoy my lunch when a shrill voice sounded out. Get up and get me some food. I want a cupcake just like yours. Now! Jeez, why did some girls think it was okay to treat guys like this? Frustrated, I went over there, picked up the cake from that boy's tray, and shoved it into her mouth. There, happy now? Poor thing, your arms must be so broken that you can't get food yourself. Let me feed you then. You're welcome. Are you crazy? You're dead meat today. She raised her hand about to slap me, but I quickly dodged, causing her to fall to the ground. As for me, I calmly sat down next to the boy and had my lunch. Sorry for wasting the cake. You can have my yogurt if you want. He's Kai, my first friend at this new school. He's witty, smart, and has a seriously impressive academic record. He was actually here on scholarship, which explained why he didn't quite fit in, just like me. I noticed how Blake seemed rather annoyed and kept staring at me. I bet he was just fed up with being teased by his friends, since I just totally ignored him. Oh, but he didn't give up that easily. The next morning, he showed up at mine to pick me up, but I'd rather run two laps around the schoolyard for being late than share a ride with you. Then at school, he tripped me up and then reached out his hand pretending to help. But between you and the floor, I picked the floor. He even waited for me at the school gates with a huge bouquet of roses. But I just took one look at them, then started coughing. Are you allergic to flowers? <coughs> nope. I'm allergic to immature and boring people, like you. Then I walked off. Ugh as if every girl was going to fall for these lame tricks. This carried on for the next few weeks, but then one time, he approached me in the library while I was studying with Kai and handed me a necklace. I looked at it, then passed it back to him and turned to talk to Kai. Seriously? You're turning me down for this nerd? Kai's smart, gallant, and sophisticated, unlike you. All you are is a troublemaker. Are you looking down on me? Oh, finally. I was wondering how much longer would it take for you to figure that out. Not to mention, you've not helped once with the English lit essay. You're in my group, but you probably just think the Grapes of Wrath is a rock band or something. So, if I can finish that essay on my own, will you go on a date with me? Fine, but it has to score an A, else you can forget it. And my trick worked. Blake actually completed the essay on his own. He's smart, but he's neglectful of his studies, 
and it's made him make mistakes. On being handed back the essay, Blake's face fell. He got a B. And even though he knew it was over, he still stayed in class to reread the teacher's comments. It seemed like this was the first time he actually put in the effort to do something. <laughs> What's wrong? Still in denial of your failure? Blake turned away without looking at me. The rich boy who lost the game for the first time looked so cute. So I put a gift with a message in it on Blake's desk. Needless to say, he was over the moon. In it was a set of clothes I'd bought for him and an invitation to a bar at the weekend. Why, you wonder? Oh, you'll see. That Saturday night, Blake showed up in the outfit I had gifted him and looked anything but pleased. <laughs> I can't come in wearing this. It's so old-fashioned. My friends will laugh at me. You invited your friends, too? To prove that you won the bet, right? If you get that thousand dollars, will I have a share? You already knew it? I was just joking at first. But now... Let's go inside now. Don't worry. We won't be here for long. I dragged him inside and immediately, his friends didn't miss the opportunity to tease me. Did the fish get hooked? Yes, I'm trapped. Quickly give him a grand. His family is bankrupt and in dire need of money. Huh? What? You're lying. Look, he's wearing donated clothes. Even his branded clothes have been liquidated. I winked at Blake, and he immediately reacted. Lend me some money. I need a place to stay, a sports car. And pocket money, too. At this point, his friends turned nasty and told him he no longer qualified to be in their group. You didn't have to do that. I already knew they only hung out with me for the money. But that's what people are just like. <sighs> Why would he think that? He must have never been cared for and loved properly. Get rid of that face. This is a date, after all. Let me make it up to you. A bar that matches this outfit. So I dragged Blake to our evening party. I told everyone that I brought a friend to lend a hand, and the elderly immediately made him do all sorts of things. Mrs. Hastings asked him to climb the tree to hang the string lights. Mr. Derbyshire called him to chop wood for the campfire, and Mr. Shaw wanted him to taste his homebrewed beer. Then the next second, Blake's already sitting on the drum throne. Huh, <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a young volunteer. That boy seems fine, doesn't he? I saw the way he looked at you. He's not suitable for me. I shrugged in response to her and suddenly felt disappointed. Yes, I liked this different side to him, but we were still from different worlds. The next morning at school, I still saw Blake hanging out with his greedy friends. Looks like he hadn't learned his lesson. Frustrated that all my efforts were in vain, I swung open my locker. Hmm, what was this note? Meet me at the library at 6 p.m. when everyone has left. I have a surprise for you. B. I shouldn't be like this, right? Waiting for him at the library for hours until everyone left? Nervous and excited? But as soon as the last person left, the light suddenly went out, and the library door slammed shut. What's happening? Could it be that the note wasn't from Blake? I screamed out of fear. That's right. I may excel at martial arts, but I hate the dark. With a shaking hand, I dialed the phone to call Blake and then slumped down in fear and sobbed. At that moment, the sound of the door unlocking startled me. As soon as the door opened, I quickly ran to hug Blake. Are you okay? I can't believe Chloe did this. I told you not to get near them. Huh? This wasn't Blake's voice. Freya, are you okay? Oh my god, it was Kai who opened the door to save me. But I thought that... I quickly let go of him, then ran away in embarrassment. That's strange. When I was in danger, the first person I thought of was Blake. Could it be that I... really liked him? At that moment, the phone rang. It was my dad. Mrs. Jones had suffered a heart attack and needed surgery immediately. But the surgery cost was so much. Where could we get that money? Ah, oh, yes. Blake's dad. So I called him. 
Hello, is this Mr. Morris? Blake stopped hanging out with his friends and did his homework. I really need the money now. Please, it's urgent. Are you bringing me out to trade with my dad? My god. It seems like Blake heard all the conversation. I... I... So, I'm just your money-making tool? And all this time you've trained me as your pet? It's not like that! We'll talk later. There's no time for your selfish thoughts right now. I gotta go! I ran like crazy to the hospital. My parents were desperate, and the money hadn't arrived yet. So I called Mr. Morris again. You said Blake had changed. If this is the case, then why did he just get fined for speeding and resisting police? Don't ever call me again. Don't worry, Freya. I'll sell the nursing home land to take care of Mrs. Jones. Everyone's agreed to move to the government nursing home. We sold our house, and now we live with Mrs. Jones in a new town. She's so much better now, but I do miss the other elderly people. Also, I miss Blake. I still keep in touch with Kai, and he told me that Blake has gone to some military school like his dad wanted. Well, that's unexpected from him. You should talk to that guy. Not about what you did, but confess your feelings to him. That will save you from regrets later. Then she patted me on the shoulder to comfort me. But I really don't have the courage to do it. I was feeling guilty. Mrs. Jones, you have a letter. Freya, look. It's the invitation to a nursing home concert. It's our concert, isn't it? Trembling, I took the invitation. What is this? I pushed Mrs. Jones's wheelchair to the door of the nursing home named Sunflower. When we walked in, we all burst into tears. Everyone was there. This is all Blake's doing. He's such a kind boy. He found us and built us a dream nursing home. You and Freya were the surprise gift we prepared for him, but as soon as he saw the two of you, he ran away. Hearing that, I rushed to the gate. A car passed me. My gut told me it was him. I ran after it and shouted in despair, Blake, wait! I like you! I really like you! But the car quickly went out of sight. I helplessly slumped down on the street, tears streaming down my face, and I still muttered, I really do like you. What are you saying? Say it louder. I turned around startled. It was Blake. He was in his military uniform and smiling at me fondly. So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You've got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way, 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around. So it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious, as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that, as every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. 
So Martin, my coach, is super handsome, has a six pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi! Hi? Um, so I just saw you, and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked, then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. Oh, um, gee, was that a wedding ring? (laughs) Don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? (laughs) and um you are smarter than you look and yep he left oh what kind of compliment was that martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments you did great rosie don't be discouraged now when you actually see someone you like you'll be more natural martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphone so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things. So I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay, I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight, sat as naturally as possible, made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh, Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG, he's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay, you should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help, what should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? but he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone, expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So, that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. 
I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. The Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. <laughs> okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then, taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So, on Valentine's night, I, myself, made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then, standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I awkwardly said, Don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl... He'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie, I was just being nice. Sorry, but you've confused the signs. Again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days... I was under a variety of emotional states, from extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single... I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, 
Dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day, your relationship turns bad, and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But, so, why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump, then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens, and follow your... I was casually walking along the hallway, just minding my own business, when I felt a cold breeze rush through the hallway. I turned my head to see, and oh, it was Natasha. Ooh. I didn't mean to look her in the eye, but I did. Oh no, was she going to hit me? Panicked, I quickly glared down at my feet. My heart was thudding with fear, and inside my head, I repeated, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. But to my relief, she walked past me. Phew! Hi, I'm Marcus, and you might be wondering why I'm so afraid of that girl, right? Well, there's a reason why her nickname is Silent But Deadly. She's the tallest girl in the school, intimidating, and she never utters a word. The school was full of rumors about her, such as how the last kid who messed with her ended up in intensive care. Nobody, and I mean nobody, should ever look her in the eye, not unless they want to end up unconscious. I definitely just had a lucky escape. Thankfully, not all the girls in my school were as terrifying as Natasha. Nope. Instead, there was this really cute girl named Naomi. She's beautiful, sweet, and gentle. Only, she's also super popular and is dating Nicholas, the captain of the basketball team. So I just kept my feelings to myself and carried on with my life. <sighs> but wait, where's my notebook? I guess I left it back in the science lab. So I rushed in there and... Oh no, Nicholas was there and he was reading my notebook. I quickly grabbed it off of him, but it was too late. He'd already taken pictures of the song lyrics I wrote about my feelings for Naomi. Blast it! So let me get this straight, a nerd like you dares to daydream about Naomi? Uh, but we have a problem here. She's my girlfriend, don't you know that? Uh, wait, it's not like that. I'll stay away from her, I promise. Nicholas gave me this unnerving look. Ugh. No good thing could ever come from a look like that. I braced myself for what he was about to do next. You have to do everything I say, else I'm going to ruin your life. Huh? Was he being serious? Judging by his devious smirk, yep, he was 100% being serious. I want you to ask Natasha out. Make sure you do it in front of the whole class. What? N Natasha? That scary girl? How could I... If you say no, the entire school will know about this. Then he waved his phone in front of me. Ugh, that vile Nicholas. But I couldn't risk my song being sent to everyone. So it looked like I had no choice. So the following day, I walked over to Natasha's desk and asked her, Natasha, um, will you be my girlfriend? The whole class was silent. Then they burst out laughing. She glared at me. Ugh, this wasn't good. I winced, preparing for the death punch. But instead, she led me out into a corner of the hallway. Then she gave me this weak smile, followed by a nod. Oh my god, did she just agree to be my girlfriend? This is crazy. It was completely beyond my expectations. But, whew, at least I was still alive, right? And that's how I ended up dating the scariest girl in school. She never spoke to me, not even a word. So I just helped her with her studies and carried her stuff around. We also exchanged numbers, but we only chatted through messages. Then one day when I was on my way to have lunch with Natasha, Nicholas strolled over to me and told me I had to take her to the cinema to catch this awful-looking rom-com, which didn't seem like her thing at all. But what other choice did I have? Nicholas' words were orders. So I asked her over lunch, and to my surprise, Natasha smiled, then gave me a big thumbs up as agreement. When I went to pick up Natasha, she was already waiting for me on her porch. She walked over with a notepad. Curious, I asked her why she had it, and she wrote, I won't be able to text you during the movie, so this will have to do. Yep, Natasha has always been different from everyone else, so I didn't ask anymore. During the film, I noticed Natasha was crying, so when it was over and we stopped for lunch, I teased her. I saw you crying during the movie. 
She slammed her notepad on the table after she wrote, I was not crying. I just laughed and took her home. Hmm, maybe she wasn't as scary as the rumors made her out to be. To be honest, she was also quite cute. <laughs> the more time I spent with Natasha, the more I started to warm to her. There was something I liked about her, even though we had only communicated through sticky notes. I was desperate to hear her voice, so I hatched a plan. When we were in the library on a study date, I picked up an old book and blew the dust in her face. She almost sneezed. But before she did, she placed her hand over her mouth and raced into the girl's bathroom. Then she returned wearing a mask. After that, I tried to make her laugh. I quickly took two pencils from the table and stuffed them into my nose and started making ugly faces. But Natasha just glared at me and handed me a note. If you continue to do these ridiculous things, there will be payback. Ha! Huh, no way was I giving up. So the next day, when I saw her by her locker, I rushed over to her and began imitating the voices of the minions. I thought it would definitely work this time, but no. Instead, she punched me in the arm. Ouch! Yep, I now learned that the rumor about her inhuman strength was not an exaggeration. So I just gave up and our relationship continued. Then one weekend, when I was at Natasha's house to study, I went down to the kitchen to get a drink, just as her mom returned from the grocery store. As I helped her unpack, we started talking. She told me about Natasha's love of collecting glass art, the pieces of which filled the house. Then her mom touched my shoulder and thanked me for making her daughter happy again. Oh man, this was awkward. Now I felt super bad. To divert the convo, I asked if Natasha talked at home, but she just smiled and replied, Natasha's such a quiet kid, right? Then she told me how it's because Natasha's always been taller than the other kids, but she has a squeaky voice. This led to lots of teasing, and once she got so upset, she pushed a boy over and accidentally caused him to have a nosebleed. Since then, people started to shun her, so she withdrew from herself and stayed silent. Hearing this made me feel so guilty. What I was doing was wrong, and Natasha didn't deserve this. Then her mom said something that truly shocked me. In middle school, this one girl named Naomi was horrible to all. The mean comments got so bad she refused to go into school for weeks at a time. Huh? Naomi? The same Naomi I know? No way! Confused, I told Natasha's mom I needed to leave and left her looking bewildered as I ran out of there. My mind was a mess. I had a crush on a mean girl. And I'm just as bad, if not worse, after what I did to Natasha. Then my phone rang with a text from Natasha. It said, Sorry if my mom said something she shouldn't have. You okay? I texted back. We need to talk tomorrow, please. So we decided to meet at her house the next day. Alone in her living room, I told her everything, including my notebook, liking Naomi and how Nicholas was blackmailing me. Natasha, please, you have to believe me. I'm sorry I did this to you. I saw the hurt look in her eyes. Then she threw a note at me and ran to her room. The note told me to get out, but before I did, I stood on the other side of her door. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I couldn't continue our relationship on a lie. Look, I like you, and I don't want to deceive you anymore. After that, I left, and I also texted Nicholas that I didn't care if he told everyone. I'm done being his puppet. The next day, I expected school to be intolerable, but to my surprise, nothing happened. Instead, I saw that Natasha was trying to sort out her locker. A crowd had gathered around her, and Naomi was taunting her. How does it feel to know that even your boyfriend likes me more? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Natasha carried on sorting out her books, but I could see that she was fighting back tears. Furious, I pushed past them all and told Naomi to stop. She just jokingly said, You know, if you wanted to date me, you could have just asked. You didn't have to spend so many months suffering with this giant scarecrow. You're right. I did like you back when I thought you were a nice person. But now I know the true you. You're a coward who only feels good when it's at the expense of someone's misery. And I can see why you target Natasha the most because she has two things you'll never have, a true kind heart and a loving spirit. After that, I pulled Natasha away and told her how sorry I am. But she didn't even glance at me and just walked off. A few days later, after PE class, I was about to go to the locker room when a classmate, Dante, came up to me. Marcus, help me carry the PE equipment into the storage room, please. I have a stomachache. He hugged his stomach, then hurriedly ran away. Without thinking much, I packed up the equipment and carried it into the storage room. As soon as I put it down, 
I realized that Nicholas, Naomi, and some guys from the basketball team were waiting there for me. Oh, well, Marcus, do you really like that weird Natasha? Didn't see that coming. Then the whole group burst into laughter. You have no right to say that to her. Take a look at yourself. Whoa, are you defending her? Then she turned to Nicholas. Babe, show him who's the boss here. Then she pulled out her phone and started recording. Nicholas smirked, then grabbed my shirt collar with one hand and reached out his fist to me with the other. I tried to struggle but couldn't get out. He was too strong. Knowing I was doomed, I closed my eyes and awaited his punch, but suddenly a loud shout came out. Stop! I opened my eyes to see Natasha and a teacher standing in front of the door. Turns out she overheard Dante bragging to some kid about Nicholas's plan. So she came to my rescue. I looked at her gratefully, but she turned away to avoid my gaze. Meanwhile, Nicholas hastily released my collar and lied to the teacher that we were just chatting. But of course, he didn't believe him and summoned them all to the supervisor's room. After that incident, Nicholas, Naomi, and the rest of the basketball team were suspended from school for two weeks. They deserved it. But who cares? I have more important things on my mind, such as winning back Natasha. I knew that her birthday was coming up, and I remembered how she loved glass art. So I bought her a glass art figure of Cinderella's glass slippers with a ticket to senior prom and a card saying, Thank you, and happy birthday. I know what you did doesn't mean you forgive me, but I want to be your real boyfriend. So I left you a ticket for senior prom. If you come and dance with me, then I know you'll give me another chance. If not, then I know that it's over. But remember, you are a special person and deserve the best. The night of prom came and I was stuck there all alone, feeling like a fool. This sucked, but after what I did, it was what I deserved. I didn't want to stick around here without her. So I was about to leave, but then my classmate tapped my shoulder and gestured for me to turn around. OMG. It was Natasha in the most beautiful crimson red dress. She walked over to me and then reached out her hand to ask me to dance. And of course, I accepted. As the song came to an end, she leaned in and whispered to me, Thank you, my hero. I can safely say that was the happiest night of my life, as it led to me having the best girlfriend ever. Oh, also her voice is actually really cute, although she does get annoyed with me when I tell her that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mia, and I lived the first 14 years of my life trapped in a lie. I never left the house, and by that, I mean never. I grew up believing that I was allergic to the sun, and if I stayed out in it too long, I'd turn to dust. Dumb, I know, but I was just a kid, and I had no reason not to believe what my mom told me. On the rare occasions, I went out into the backyard, and my skin turned all blotchy and puffy. Looking back on it now, it's clear mom had given me something to bring my skin out in a rash, but at the time, I honestly believed the sun was out to get me. I remember peering behind the curtain and watching the kids play out in the street. They looked like they were having so much fun, and I felt so sad that I couldn't join them. Mom charged into my room, quickly closed the curtain, and then she grabbed my shoulders and shouted at me. Mia, never do that again. The sun can come in through the curtains and turn you to a crisp. Is that what you want? I remember sobbing as I shook my head. I never did peer out at the other kids again after that. I could still hear them playing, so I would close my eyes and imagine that I was out there with them, playing chase and learning how to ride a bike. I so wanted that to be my reality. The problem was I didn't have that life. Instead, I was stuck inside with no friends. I'd never even touched the grass before. Mom homeschooled me. She took this really seriously and got really mad when I didn't understand something. One time, I gave the wrong answer to a math equation, so she screamed at me. You're such an idiot! I've had enough of you! Then she locked me in my room without dinner. Crazy, huh? But back then, I was so scared that from then, I didn't dare to ask her anything. It's always just mom and me, and no one else in my house. She said my dad had died when I was a baby. Again, I had no reason not to believe her. I never had a phone to talk to anyone, and who did I have to talk to? Still... I remember being fascinated by this strange object she often pressed to her ear. Whenever she was on the phone, I believed she was talking to herself. Mom would lock me in the house while she went out. Then when she returned, she'd just throw me something to eat. 
a sandwich, a packet of potato chips, and sometimes she changed the meal to bread. She never really cooked. I'm not even sure if she knew how to. My house was a simple old house. There's not many things in it. No TV, no sofa, a basic kitchen. I mean, it looks like an abandoned house, but I thought it was normal because I'd not seen any other houses. My room was small, cold, and dark. I only had a hard mattress and some itchy old pillows. I didn't even have a bed cover. I used to shiver myself to sleep each night and dream of being out there playing with the other kids. Then, things got worse when I turned 10. Mom stormed into my room, gave me some food and a pile of books, and told me that I had to stay in my room from now on so she knew I was safe. I put up with four years of this. It was horrible. She chucked my meals at me and gave me new books once a week. I felt so hungry and lonely all the time. Then one day, when evening arrived and she still hadn't fed me, my hunger pains got the better of me. So I tried the door, and to my surprise, it wasn't locked. So I snuck downstairs. That's when I saw Mom pacing the room, her phone in hand. She said, Yes, I know, Toby. Well, she's finally of age, so when are you coming to get her? Then she said, Tomorrow at 10 a.m. I will be counting the money. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right. Then I heard Mum say, Well, I suppose I better go and feed her then. I quickly darted upstairs and lay on my mattress. Mum appeared and passed me a sandwich and some water. She sat down next to me, which was odd, as she hardly ever did this. And she smiled at me as she said, We need to get you cleaned up, and I've bought you a new dress to wear. Why, Mum? I asked her. Her smile faded into a scowl, and she kicked my mattress. Why do you always have to be so insolent? I didn't want to upset her further, so I didn't ask her anything else. Then the next day, Mom made me put the new dress on and let me out of my room. Then there was a knock at the door, and Mom brought this strange man in. I'd never interacted with anyone other than Mom before, so I just sat there, feeling afraid. He was around my mom's age and tall, really tall, and he had unkind eyes. He passed my mom an envelope, and she opened it and took out a lot of bits of paper. I know now that this was money, but back then, I didn't fully understand what it was. Mom counted it out, then nodded at him and said, She's all yours. Right. You're coming with me, sweetie. He walked towards me. Wh what I stared at him, open-mouthed. Mia, you're going to live with this man now. Mom said it like it was no big deal. That's what happens when you turn 14. You have to leave. But Mom, why? I don't know him. I won't go. Then she slapped me and shouted out loud, Go with him. I'm done with you. That's when I realized that I couldn't live with this woman anymore. I ran out of the front door. Surely turning to dust was better than living with any of them. Only, as the sun touched my skin, it didn't burn. That's when I knew Mom had been lying to me all this time, so I started running without knowing where I was going. I could hear Mom and that Toby guy chasing and shouting after me, but I just kept on running. Every little sound freaked me out, as I didn't understand this world and the people in it. The next thing I remember is some woman shaking me and saying, Sweetie, are you okay? I was so afraid at first and curled up into a ball, but then she told me she wasn't going to hurt me, she just wanted to help me. She had kind eyes, not like mom or that man, so I told her what had happened. She looked completely shocked, but she rang the police. So, it turns out that when I was a baby, I was stolen. My mom isn't really my mom at all. She was some messed up woman who took me out of my pushchair and made some awful deal with that Toby man that he could buy me off her when I was 14. She didn't know my real parents. She just saw a chance to grab me, and she took it. It's horrible to think that she robbed me of a normal life, but I try not to dwell on this thought too much. I can't change the past. Then eventually, something amazing happened. My real parents were found. It was so emotional seeing them for the first time. They hugged me, and we all just cried. They told me how they'd never stopped looking for me. And guess what? I found out I have a little sister called Izzy. I love hanging out with her and watching her play. She's the best.
It's been hard. There's so much I've had to learn, such as how to interact with people, and even how to eat with a knife and fork. My real parents have been so kind and patient with me. Now, at the age of 19, I have some sort of normal life. I still find many things confusing, and I struggle being around large crowds. I had to get used to sleeping on a bed, and I find computers the most confusing thing ever. But I managed to function in the big, wide world. As for my fake mom and Toby, well, they were both sentenced for their involvement in my kidnap and are now in jail for a very long time. I have a chance at leading a normal life in the normal world, and even though what happened to me was horrible, I'm not going to let those cruel people ruin my life. I finally have a loving family, and I know that with their care and support, I can get through anything. When my boyfriend and I broke up before heading off to different universities, I never imagined that my love life would take a pretty dramatic turn, where I ended up being the third wheel in an affair. Let me backtrack a bit. I'm Juliana, a 19-year-old amateur marathon runner. I'd been a part of a running club for the past five years that met twice a week. And during that time, I became quite close to two of the runners there. They were both much older than me, but we got on well. Leo was a middle-aged bachelor, and Charlotte was a mom of two and had been married for more than 20 years. They both worked together in the same trading company, and I can't really explain it, but we all just clicked. We always ran together, but one morning, Leo didn't turn up. That was odd because he never missed a session. Anyway, Charlotte and I ran together, and that night I received a message from Leo asking if I wanted to have dinner with him. I was a bit surprised, but... This was Leo's first time inviting me to a private meal, but I still said yes, and we went to a restaurant downtown. At dinner, we got into some deep conversations, and at one point, I asked him, why have you stayed single till now? He stopped a bit and replied to me, um, it's hard to say, but I've just had a bad breakup a few years ago, and I wasn't ready to get into another relationship. Oh, that's why he decided to stay single, even though he's a pretty successful and attractive man. It was quite awkward after that, so I broke the silence by asking him why he hadn't come running that morning, and he just said something had come up at work. He was acting a little strange, but I didn't push it. Anyway, it was a nice dinner, and afterwards we shared a cab home, as we lived on the same street. Well, that's when something weird happened. Charlotte was waiting on his doorstep. Leo looked shocked to see her there, and quickly ran out to check what was wrong. Charlotte hadn't seen me, so I wound the window down and happily waved to her, but to my complete surprise, she looked kind of annoyed. Then she just said they had work to do, and she hoped I got home safely. I didn't give it much thought, but in hindsight, oh, what kind of work project needs to be done at 10 p.m.? Anyway, I didn't give it much thought. Surely there couldn't have been anything going on, right? I mean, Charlotte and Leo are colleagues and also close friends. And I'd met Charlotte's family. Sure, her husband was away for work a lot, but they loved each other. And they had kids together. I got home and chilled for a bit. Then about an hour later, I received a text from Leo, asking if I'd like to join him for a midnight run. I immediately said yes. Well, to be honest, deep down, I totally had a bit of a crush on him. Even though I knew my parents would freak if they ever found out I was hanging out with a guy old enough to be my dad. It excites me, though. So I went for a run along the beach with him, and afterwards we got some takeaway food and sat on the sand, listening to the waves and watching the stars. I guess we were both high off adrenaline, and also it was such a romantic setting with all the city lights reflected on the water. So we got into a really deep conversation about relationships and what we want from love. Then one thing led to another, and we started kissing. We ended up spending the whole night on the beach and even watched the sunrise. When I got home, I couldn't stop smiling. But then I saw I had five missed calls from Charlotte. I quickly called her back, thinking something must have happened. But when she picked up, she just said, Where were you last night? I told her I was on a run, and she said, With who? So I said, With Leo? Um, why? And she just said, Oh, I was just curious. He wasn't answering my calls. Then we hung up. Um, how strange, I thought. 
Anyway, that night, Leo asked me if I wanted to have dinner together again, and of course I said yes. I was dying to know if last night had just been a one-night makeout sesh, or if it could mean something more. When I saw him, I said to him, Leo, sorry about last night. I got carried away, and I'm like half your age. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I don't know what I was thinking. I expected him to say it was okay, and that he enjoyed it like I did. But instead, he said, yeah, let's just pretend that nothing happened. I felt so awkward after that, but I couldn't deny my feelings for him. After that, we got even closer, though. We spent more time together and spoke on the phone every night for hours. Then one night, Charlotte called me and said she'd had a fight with Leo, and that's why she'd gone to his place the week before. Ah, now it all made sense. So that's why they hadn't been coming to the running club together. She said they still hadn't made up, and she needed someone to talk to. She sounded upset, but wouldn't tell me what the fight was about. Then she asked if we could meet up, although it was quite awkward. I had to tell her I was actually going to the theater with Leo. Leo and I both love going to the theater, and that night we had tickets to see Shakespeare in the park. She asked why we hadn't invited her to join, and I said she could totally join us, but obviously it was too late to get tickets. Then she just hung up. Next days, I realized that Charlotte and Leo would only attend alternate running sessions so that they could avoid each other. I talked to both Leo and Charlotte about it, but they simply claimed that their work was getting stressful and hence they could only handle one training session a week. Then one Friday morning, I noticed Charlotte was in a seriously foul mood. Normally she was so upbeat, so I asked her what was up, and that's when she told me. She'd been having an affair with Leo for the past three years. I was shook. I mean, I guess I should have seen it coming, but I still couldn't hide my shock. I'd thought of her as such a role model, with this amazing family and a great job. And yet, here she was, nothing but a cheat. And with Leo, the guy I was seeing. Oh my god, what kind of mess had I got involved in? Charlotte begged me to keep it a secret, but I couldn't even speak. I was in complete denial. If she knew what Leo and I had been up to? And yet, why did it matter? She was the one having an affair, not me. I continued to see Leo, and one time he even invited me over to watch a movie at his place. And we made out again. It was amazing. But at the same time, I had Charlotte calling me every night for moral support, which made things really weird. For the next month or so, Leo and I kept meeting up, and I loved it. But I knew that if Charlotte found out, she'd kill me. It was such a dilemma. Then one night, she called me and said, If you're my friend, Juliana, you'll stop seeing Leo. Please, I'm begging you. I couldn't believe it. How did she know? Um, sorry, Charlotte. How did you find out? She said it was a woman's sixth sense, and that she'd known ever since the night when I'd been in the cab with him. Plus, she said it was obvious that I'd had a crush on him for a while. All right, but why do you care if I'm still with Leo? You're married. He's single. He can do whatever he wants, I said to her. Then she said, please, for my sanity, please stop seeing him. I'm jealous, okay? It hurts to know you're together. Plus, he's not a good guy. Well, that did it. I wasn't going to break the sisters before misters rule. So I stopped seeing Leo. I couldn't hurt Charlotte like that even though she was actually the one hurting her whole family by having this affair. Not seeing Leo made me miss him so much, but I told myself I had to keep my word to Charlotte. And yet you won't believe what happened next. Charlotte started seeing Leo again. I was so angry. She'd asked me to stop seeing him and had even said he wasn't a good guy. All so she could have him to herself again? What kind of married woman does that? Honestly, I was raging. One morning after running, I marched over to her and said, Do you not have any self-respect? What about your poor husband? Charlotte went bright red and said, I'm trying my best. I know you're right, and I should respect myself and my husband more. You know what? From now on, I will keep my distance from Leo, just like you. Trust me. Okay, so at least she had the decency to say that and I hoped she could do exactly what she said. After that, I decided to take a break out of this complicated three-person relationship and try to forget about Leo. I avoided him at the running club, and he avoided me too. Charlotte told me she'd spoken to him about dating me and how inappropriate it was for him to date someone as young as me, so maybe that's why the feeling was mutual. And he avoided me too. After all, it's better that way. He was way too old for me anyway.
Plus, I was heading off to university, so it was all for the best. About Charlotte, after I confronted her, we actually became closer. And even now that I'm at university, she still calls me sometimes to ask how I'm doing. I asked her about Leo, and you won't believe it, but apparently Leo is now dating someone. Okay, I guess that's better for everyone. Although I sometimes wonder, if they break up, will he start up his affair with Charlotte again? Well, it's a story about my ebullient youth. When I got into so much trouble just because I fell in love with a middle-aged man. That whole period of my life was such a weird and messy time, right? But now I'm so glad I've met a nice guy my own age. And of course, I never want to get involved in being a third wheel ever again. Hey guys, it's me again, Ellie. So in the first part of my story, I told you about how my dad abandoned me and my mom when I was just a kid to go live with his mistress. And that made me never want to date guys. But then I met Brian and we got engaged. Meeting his mom was a huge shock because she was none other than my dad's mistress from all those years ago. I couldn't handle it and decided to get revenge. First, I started working in her company. And then I noticed she had a crush on Clark, the head of the software design department. So I decided to steal him from her. And you won't believe what happened next. One Friday evening, after everyone had left, I noticed that Clark was still working. I made him a cup of coffee and asked about how the proposal he was working on was going. We had a pretty nice chat, and I tried to flirt with him. I won't lie, I started to see why Sasha fancied him. He was a really nice guy. I even gave him my number and said if he ever needed any help with the proposal, just to call me. We didn't get to chat for long, though, because Brian suddenly called me and said he was waiting outside. When I got downstairs, he was dressed up in a nice shirt and said he wanted to take me to our favorite restaurant. I was pretty surprised because we hadn't gone on a spontaneous date in a while. We'd both been so busy recently. I ordered my favorite ramen soup, and then I smiled and asked Brian in a teasing way, What's the occasion? You haven't taken me out on a date in ages. I waited for him to reply, and he wouldn't look at me. I started to panic and asked him, Brian, what is it? Is something wrong? Then he told me that he'd just been assigned to manage a big project in New York. He said he needed to fly there the following week and that the project was expected to last three months. But he said he'd come back every weekend to see me and that it was just temporary. I couldn't even respond. I just stared at him with the noodle hanging out of my mouth. My heart was doing somersaults. Brian started laughing and said, Look at you, Ellie. Your mouth is open so wide you're basically drooling. Come on, I'll be back every weekend. Poor Brian, he didn't even know what I was thinking right now. This coincidence was such a perfect ingredient for my revenge recipe, because now I could carry out my revenge on his mom without him knowing. Brian had no idea what I was up to, and I felt kind of bad. He really loved me, and I didn't want to hurt him by doing this to his mom, but I had to. I had to get revenge. Nothing else mattered. Later that night... We were watching a movie together in bed, and as the movie ended, Brian said he was exhausted and wanted to go to sleep, but my phone beeped right at that moment. It was a text from Clark. I didn't want Brian to see, so I took my phone to the bathroom to reply to him, and it said, Thanks for your support tonight. Due to that, I had came up with a possible solution for the proposal. For the rest of the night, while Brian slept sweetly next to me, Clark and I texted back and forth all night. So far, it looked like my plan was working. Then, the next week, Brian left for his business trip, and as expected, he was so busy he couldn't make it back every weekend to see me. I missed him so much, but I was also grateful because it gave me time to really get to know Clark. And during those three months, we became quite close. Of course, during that time, Sasha still consistently flirted with Clark. It was super awkward because he clearly wasn't interested. One weekend, we had a team bonding trip and went stand-up paddleboarding. Sasha pretended she couldn't do it and kept asking Clark to help her, but he pretty much ignored her and hung out with our other colleagues instead. And then she asked him to join her for lunch one day, but he said he was busy, and I just had to laugh, because actually, he was having lunch with me. I had to be really careful that she didn't discover I was flirting with Clark, because then I could lose my job and my plan would have failed. Also, not to mention the fact that I was engaged to her son, and if any mom saw her daughter-in-law to be flirting with some other guy, she'd freak out. Honestly, it was nerve-wracking. 
I was constantly on edge, terrifying that she'd notice what I was up to. And there were a couple of times where she almost caught me. One night, both Clark and I worked late, and we left the office together and planned to go for a drink. But as soon as we got in Clark's car, I saw Sasha pulling into the car park. She spotted Clark and his car. She literally drove her car toward us. Her face was so cheerful that I knew she would walk toward Clark's car when she got out of her car. At that moment, I knew I had to get out of Clark's car ASAP before she noticed me. I excused Clark that I'd left my phone upstairs, and before Clark could have any responses, I got out of his car and ran as fast as I could. Just only when I safely hid behind a big pillar did I stop to breathe and realize that my heart almost exploded from fear. From that time, I was more careful with Sasha, but it was so hard. A day when I was making a move to Clark in his office, I sat close to him and gave him an affectionate look. And someone knocked on the door, I abruptly got off Clark because I thought that was Brian's mom again. I breathed a sigh of relief when realizing it was only Clark's secretary, yet my heart was still beating very rapidly. It was all worth it, though. After two months of flirting with him, he confessed to me that he liked me. When I read the text from him, I was so happy I actually squealed. I'd done it. Now for part two of my plan. I was going to use Clark to find out exactly how I could make Sasha's company collapse into a million little pieces. So, when Clark asked me to be his girlfriend, I agreed, but on one condition, that we kept it a secret. Clark agreed to this because he knew there would be lots of troubles if Sasha found out. And honestly, Clark treated me so nicely, even nicer than Brian did. He showered me in gifts and he really listened to me. Anytime I told him I liked something, he remembered and would surprise me with it the next time I saw him. At work, we had to keep things on the down low, but every morning I'd find a handwritten love note in the drawer of my desk. It really made me feel guilty because it was clear Clark liked me a lot, and there I was, just using him for revenge. The company was about to release the new app they'd been working on for the past year, and it was expected to make the company gain a huge market share and beat all its competitors, including my old company. So, I started doing overtime with Clark, so that I could get access to the info on how the software for this app had been created. It was top secret info, and as a junior project manager, I had no right to this info. My old company would love to get their hands on this confidential info, and with it, they could easily kick Sasha's company to the curb and dominate the market. Then, she'd have lost not just her crush, but also her career. Served her right for what she did to me and my family. One night, after we'd worked super late, he turned to me and said, We should get going. I'm exhausted. He went to the toilet before we left and asked me to sort out the documents. As soon as he left the room, I took photos of the app development plan and all the different steps in creating the software. This was like gold, but Clark was too quick. He came back before I'd managed to take a pic of the last document. Dang. Now I just need to find another opportunity to get that last bit of info. But I had to act quickly, because the app was about to be released, and my old company was urging me to send the documents ASAP. That night, I felt so anxious that I couldn't sleep. What was I playing at? I mean, sure, I wanted to get revenge on Sasha, she deserved it, but this would crush Brian, who I really did love. And then what about Clark? He liked me so much and had no clue that I was just using him. He'd be devastated if he found out. How had I gone from being an independent single girl with no interest in guys to the kind of girl who two-timed? I couldn't stop thinking about it all, but I had to focus. The revenge plan needed to go ahead. The next morning, I woke up feeling exhausted, but luckily it was the weekend. I'd arranged to go over to Clark's place to try and get my hands on that last document, but unfortunately, Clark wasn't interested in talking about work. He said it was the weekend and he just wanted to relax with me. Then he suggested we rent bikes and cycle over the Golden Gate Bridge and have a picnic to watch the sunset. Wow, it ended up being the best day ever. I felt so happy and I hadn't realized how funny Clark could be. We laughed nonstop and I didn't want the day to end. We kissed under the sunset. How romantic it was. But little did I know what was waiting for me at home. It's only 6 a.m.
But Dad already woke me up. Hurry up, LaDonna. A huge storm's coming. Poor households await the city's plan for food and shelter. Oh, then what's the mayor's plan for my food? But Dad didn't listen and just drove away without letting me have breakfast. Well, I'm used to this anyway. A little backstory. We came from a long line of politicians. My grandpa, my uncles, all worked for the government. My dad actually broke with tradition and became a successful businessman. But I guess the apple really can't fall far from the tree. Last year, he took a sudden U-turn and moved back to his hometown to pursue a political career. And he was elected mayor! Since then, he had no time left for me. Not to mention the judgy eyes I had to face at school. You look fine. It's not you. It's your dad's new policy they're whispering about. Don't mind them, LaDonna. What do us kids know about politics anyway? Here they are, Kira and Troy, my only friends here. In fact, Troy's even in a similar situation. His mom is the chief of police, but he deals with it pretty well. Have you been to the White House? Does the key to the city really open anything? Can you tell your dad to ban homework? Seriously, how could Troy stay calm before these stupid questions? And even the teachers wouldn't leave me alone. They always put me in charge of things. Please, just because my dad has great leadership doesn't mean I do too. As if I wasn't already swamped with chores. Once the last bell rang, I rushed to the grocery store. Since dad's always busy now, poor old me had to take up housework, and it's frozen meals all day every day. But today he'd come home early for dinner, so I'm gonna throw a feast. Except, none of these tasted edible. What's the problem? I followed the recipes very carefully. Did I come home at the wrong time? No, Dad, a perfect timing. My apple pie's ready. You mean that smoking thing in the oven? Oh no, my only ray of hope has also turned to ashes. I immediately ran to the convenience store, grabbed all of the instant foods and dashed home. But Dad's already fallen asleep. He must be exhausted. It's always been him who raised me, as mom passed away giving birth to me. Now on top of that, he had to take care of this whole town. He needed a partner to share his burden, and I needed to be taken care of as well. Let's see, getting to know someone new with dad's hectic schedule would be impossible. So maybe reconnect him with one of his exes? From my aunt, I learned he had two ex-girlfriends. One is Jade, his old classmate who's still single. Two is Alva, no other information. Let's start with Jade then. Next day, I immediately told Troy and Kira about my master plan. That's my Aunt Jade. No way! It's faded! Suddenly, a group rushed towards us, babbling about my uncle being appointed temporary secretary of state. Jeez, chill, guys! They kept flocking around, making me feel suffocated. Panicked, I ran away, and as I turned the corner, a hand pulled me back. Calm down. You're safe from that crazy crowd now. Thanks, but why did you help me? I've been in your position. I know what you're going through. Just like that, I found myself comfortably venting everything to her. It must be hard for your family of two. That's why I'm finding him a wife. Oh, good luck to you then, sweetie. I have to go now. What a lovely lady. If only everyone could be like her. With Kira's help, setting up a date for Dad and Jade was a piece of cake. We both dragged them to the same restaurant, then cued some cliché matchmaking moments. Me and Kira quickly excused ourselves and monitored things from afar. They seemed to have a good time, but as we leaned closer... Huh? Inflation? Food security? Obesity epidemic? They'd been chatting about politics this whole time? Dad! That's exactly why you're single! <sighs> On the way home, I constantly mentioned Jade, but Dad was nonchalant and switched the subject to his meeting instead. Ugh. Another one in 30 minutes. I'll have to stay home alone tonight. As he dropped me off, he added, Find yourself a boyfriend first before trying to set me up. <laughs> How annoying! I then called Kira to inform her that our matchmaking plan had failed, but it took her a while to accept it. You give up too soon. Is it because you don't like my aunt? No, Kira, it's because I know my dad. And if he said no, it's a no. Okay, now plan B. Alva. I did some digging and figured out the neighborhood where she lived. I'll go there tomorrow. So here I am now, completely lost. Except, isn't that the woman who helped me at school? I rushed over and thanked her for the other day, but she seemed a little off. After a lot of persuading, she finally told me the cause of her sorrow, a tragic love story. His family are all politicians, so they can't accept someone mediocre like me. I'm so sorry, but I'm sure you can find someone better. She shook her head, saying he'd recently moved back to town and was still single. That got her reminiscing about the good old days. But sadly, he's seeing someone else. <laughs> Wait a sec. Is that a photo of you two? May I see? She showed it to me. My thought exactly. That's my dad. So you're Alva? Yes. 
but how do you know? Because you're my dad's ex, just who I'm looking for. I shrieked in happiness, but strangely, she cried even harder, then hugged me. If that's your dad, then LaDonna, I'm not just his ex. I'm your mom. Hold up, what now? So, they were deeply in love despite my dad's family's disapproval. But when I was born, they got even angrier and kicked her out. Yet, this entire time, I thought my poor mom was no longer on this earth. Our reunion was cut short by dad's call. I wanted to ask him everything ASAP, but mom signaled me not to. Honey, don't tell Robert yet. Of course, I look forward to our family's reunion, but I'm not ready to meet him. And perhaps neither is he. It'll be awkward for him and the woman he's seeing. No worries, mom. There's nothing between them. The only woman for him is you. Having mom beside me made my life so much better. She's a successful businesswoman, but still puts work aside to spend time with me. We went on picnics, shopping, watched movies together. And her cooking is the best. I devoured the grilled ribs in an instant. It's a thousand times better than frozen food. When I'm around her, I can be myself without worrying about the public's eye. I wish I could skip class every day to stay home with mom like this, but it's not that easy. At school, I excitedly told Kira and Troy all about my fun outings with mom, but they looked rather uninterested. Whatever, mom will pick me up later and we'll have a blast. Suddenly, buzzing talks from other tables cut off my thoughts. My cat eats faster than her. Indeed, our graceful princess. Guys, don't be fooled. She's in fact a delinquent who skips class all the time. Having a mare daddy is so lucky. If we did that, we'd be kicked out right away. Those mean girls always have something bad to say. I headed toward them to settle this once and for all, but my father's words echoed in my mind. LaDonna, everyone judges me by your behavior. Ugh, fine. They're right, LaDonna. You've been absent quite a lot lately. I, I just want to be around my mother. A good mom would never tell her daughter to skip class. Think about it. There must be a reason for your whole family to be against her. What do you know? They were the bad guys who unreasonably looked down on her. Then why did your dad keep in touch with my aunt, but cut ties with her? So, Kira was still annoyed that my dad and her aunt didn't become a thing? How petty. I walked off, but Troy ran after me. Kira's just worried about you. Also, you're living in the same town as your mom now. You'll have lots of time with her, so don't play truant again, okay? Here, I've marked the important parts we learned during your absence. Troy has always been gentle to me. He's right. I have tons of time for mom, but we can't keep sneaking around like this. My parents should reunite soon. I remembered the story of how my mom first met dad and got an idea. What's so important that you have to come here in this weather? I promised to help out a friend. Please pull over here and wait for me. The friend I was helping was none other than mom. I then waited a bit before telling dad to bring me an umbrella because it's raining too hard. Now it's your turn. Go get him, mom. And just like that, the romantic scene from many years ago was reenacted right before my eyes. My mom was soaking wet, dashed through the rain, then bumped into my father. My dad then bent down to help her up, looked right into her eyes, and dropped her on the ground? I was still in shock when dad charged towards me and dragged me back to the car. How did you know that woman? Um, I asked around. Just stop. Never see her again, got it? His extreme reaction was proof that mom really mattered. They'll definitely get back together soon because they had me, their special bond. That night, I called mom. She must have been really upset. It's all right, honey. I'm used to it. Your dad's family was... Never mind. Your birthday's coming. LaDonna, what do you want for a present? I just want you to be with me. Yes, sweetie. If only we could celebrate as a family. That's it. I insisted dad throw me a huge birthday party. I invited all my friends and acquaintances. When the party began, I stepped on stage and thanked everyone for coming. Lastly, the biggest thanks goes to the people who brought me into this world. Dad, Mom, please join me. I believe you all know my father already, but my mother, Alva Garrix. The crowd began talking and pointing. Now Dad has to acknowledge her. Please, it's a misunderstanding. Miss Garrix here is only an old friend, and it seems she got along very well with my daughter, which is just adorable. <laughs> Let's toast to our little princess's birthday. Unbelievable! He's fully committed to disregarding her. As the guests were busy chatting, Dad pulled me into a room. Ugh! He doesn't have the right to be mad here. Old friend, you're straight up lying. Elva is my mother. No, she's a gold digger. Look, there's no time right now. When do you ever have time for me? Dad just sighed, apologized, then sat me down to tell me that back when he first started his business, it failed, but he didn't want to ask his family for help. Mom berated him, saying he was a dumb loser who wouldn't take advantage of his family's power. Unable to change his mind, Mom left after I was born. 
No, no, that's not it. I'm sorry, Robert. I shouldn't have shown up here. It's all my fault. I... She suddenly passed out. Panicked, Dad and I put her in bed. That night, I checked on Mom constantly, then fell asleep next to her. I was awoken by my phone's notifications, so I quickly went out to check to not wake Mom. Oh my, hundreds of articles about my dad came up. His old photos with Jade and with my mother were all over the news. The press was saying that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Dad's bombarded with calls from dozens of news outlets. It's her. Only Elva has these photos. Dad, look! How could such a frail person do anything? Suddenly, I saw a figure at the door to Mom's room. Dad and I tiptoed over, then grabbed them. Aha! Gotcha! Huh? Kira? Kira claimed that my mom's very suspicious, so she had to keep an eye on her. I swear she's faking it. I heard her on the phone just now. Enough, Kira! You're out of line this time. I don't want such a petty friend. Leave! Kira didn't say another word and just left. So did my dad. The protest at 4th Street is still going strong? All right, I'm coming. It's always work, work, work. Do these strangers matter more to him than his wife and kid? The next day, Troy asked me to meet up at the park for some update. So I unloaded everything onto him. I can't believe my dad rejected mom just to save face like that. He's not making as much money as when he had his business. Why is he so dead set on this job? I used to think like that about my mom too, but then I realized that she wasn't doing her job for money or fame, but simply contributing to society. I now entirely support her, because it's her life's purpose. It might be the same for your dad. What Troy said lingered in my mind. It does make sense. If dad's all about glory, there's many other ways which don't require him bending over backwards day in and day out like this. Troy's always been understanding to his mom. And me? I've never been supportive of dad when he had to juggle between his job and me. When I got home, Mom was nowhere to be seen, except a letter on the table. Mom said she's terminally ill and didn't have much longer. That's why she risked everything to be with me. But now her health worsened. She didn't want me to witness her pitiful condition, so she left. I immediately called her. It's dangerous in this abandoned construction site. Please don't come. I just need you to know I love you, LaDonna. I immediately knew where she was when she said that. I rushed over, but at the entrance, a scary-looking crew approached me. Don't worry, sweetie. They're our friends. Just listen to them. They wasted no time tying me up, then called Dad. As soon as he arrived, Mom dropped her act. Turned out, she planned to approach me right after knowing he was elected mayor. Her wish to rekindle with us was just to use Dad. But it didn't work on him, so she's pushing things this far. Sign here, and our daughter will be safe. Many people will go bankrupt if that's signed. Don't ever think you could fool me. You couldn't care less about your daughter. Or are you still counting on those useless cops? Ma'am, you underestimate our law enforcers. It's Troy and Kira, followed by undercover policemen coming from all directions. Turns out, Kira actually heard the calls Alva made to her accomplices. She then told Troy and asked his mom to look into Alva. Coincidentally, the police had always been after Alva because she's been involved in a scheme that gave tenants a ridiculously huge debt. She colluded with the former mayor and wanted to continue the scam with my dad now. Before she's taken away, Alva still cried and begged for my help. I was nothing more than a puppet to you, and now you're talking about maternal love? A scammer like you deserves to be brought to justice. After Alva's arrest, I broke down crying. She's my mother. That's the only truth among all those lies. Dad hugged me and said sorry for everything. It's all my fault. I just foolishly fell into her trap because I wanted someone to take care of us. I'm sorry, LaDonna. You went through so much because of me and my job. It's okay, Dad. Now I see how meaningful your work is. I'm proud to be your daughter. And you too. Thank you. I decided to sign up for a cooking class to better support Dad. And this banquet is the fruits of my hard work. But before he could even sit down, an emergency call came. He gave me a sorry look, but I gladly said, Bye, Dad. I'll save you some. I was a little bummed out. But it's his job after all. And if he can't be changed, why not learn to enjoy it? Moments later, these hungry hippos already came. But hey, this just came to my mind. How about Troy's mom? She's also single and would look great with your dad, right? Nah, I've realized he already has a love of his life, serving the community. He's very happy with his choice. So I'll leave him be, for now. That's right. Besides, we can't be family. At least, not yet. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda, and I'm 17 years old. This is a story about how I fell in love with my adoptive dad and the crazy things I discovered because of it. I need to be honest, as I've not had the easiest life, so when I fell in love with him, 
I probably wasn't thinking straight. My childhood was tough, as it was just me and my mom, and we lived in a slum in the city. My mom was pretty irritable, and she always took it out on me when she'd had too much to drink. I got used to it quickly, and hardly even cried when she did this. I just thought it was normal to be treated like this. But when I was seven, my mom got arrested for fraud and drug use, and she got sentenced to ten years in prison. I'll never forget the moment the police broke our door down and took my mom away. It was late at night, and I just screamed and cried. All I had was my mom. Without her, I was nobody. Even though she hurt me when she was drunk, she was still my mom, and I loved her so much, and she loved me too. After she was taken away, and the police said I wouldn't see her for a while, social services placed me in an orphanage. Life there was even worse than in the slum with my mom, but I told myself it was only 10 years, and that as soon as my mom was released from prison, she'd come get me, and that by then, she'd have changed and wouldn't hit me anymore. But that's not what happened. After one year, an old couple came to adopt me. They'd been trying to have a baby for years with no luck. I thought maybe this was my chance to finally have a loving home. They cried with happiness when they saw me, but the minute we got back to their house, everything went downhill. They were both quite old and strict, and immediately sat me down and went over their set of rules. It was torture. Anytime I did one thing wrong, like accidentally breaking a glass or spilling some soy sauce on the table, they'd punish me by starving me for the whole day, until I almost fainted. After three months of this, they took me back to the orphanage and complained that I was a spoiled little brat with no manners. To be honest though, I was relieved. They were old and grumpy, and we clearly weren't well suited. Years passed by, and when I was 12, I was adopted by another family who ran a small restaurant. I stupidly thought it would be better this time, and at first it was, but pretty soon they started making me help out in the restaurant, doing all their chores and even the housework at home. I very quickly realized they'd basically just adopted me so I could be their maid. But there was one nice thing about this family, their son. His name was Jose and he was two years older than me. Unlike his parents, he was actually super kind. He would often steal food from me from the kitchen and even helped me finish the chores. But one time, his mom saw Jose helping me and thought I'd forced him into it. She was so angry at me, she took me straight back to the orphanage. I couldn't believe it. After four years, they just sent me back. After those two disastrous attempts at being adopted, I thought I'd never find a family who actually wanted me. I pretty much gave up all hope and resigned myself to the fact that I just have to endure the orphanage life until my mom got let out of prison. But then, one day, a man named James came to the orphanage to volunteer, and that's when my life changed. He looked quite young, around 40 or so, and he had a kind smile. Often, I'd catch him looking at me, and it made me feel quite shy. No one had ever paid me attention like this before, not even my mom. Then one day, the woman who worked at the orphanage took me aside and told me that James wanted to adopt me. I told them I wasn't interested, and then I went to my room. Honestly, I was sick and tired of these foster families who just used me. I didn't want to go through that again. The next day, I was sitting on the swing in the garden of the orphanage when James came over. I got up off the swing and was about to leave when he asked if we could sit and talk a little bit. I was really hesitant but he had such a kind face, and I felt bad being rude. He then showed me a photo of a woman and a child, and I couldn't believe how much the child looked like me when I was younger. He told me that they were his wife and his daughter, but that they had died in a car accident eight months ago, and that he still couldn't get over the loss. So he'd been coming to the orphanage to volunteer, and now he felt ready to adopt someone. Then he looked at me and said, As soon as I saw you, Amanda, I knew you were the one I wanted to adopt. I didn't know what to say. I felt so sorry for him, and I knew what it felt like to experience loss. So I told him I'd be happy if he wanted to adopt me. He was so excited, and the very next day, he came to pick me up and take me to my new home. I was quite nervous, but as soon as I saw how cozy the house was, covered in family photos, and with a nice bedroom for me, I knew I'd made the right decision. 
James was the perfect adoptive dad. He was polite and kind and always listened to me. He didn't make me do chores, and he didn't create a strict set of rules for me to follow. With him, I could just be myself, and for the first time in years, I was happy. He made me laugh so much. Finally, life was good. But there was just one little problem. You see, I was a teenage girl, and the more time I spent with James, the more I started to think I liked him in a way that wasn't appropriate for a relationship between an adoptive dad and his daughter. One night, he was getting out of the shower, and he'd left the door open. I saw him standing there, wearing a towel around his waist, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. I knew it was wrong to be looking, but I just couldn't stop. Then one day, he was doing some gardening, and he hurt his back. I offered to give him a massage, and he was so grateful. As I rubbed his back with oil, he said to me, Oh, Amanda, your hands are so soft. I haven't felt so comfortable in a long time. I was glad he couldn't see my face, because I was blushing like crazy. Afterwards, he offered to give me a foot massage, but I said no because I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. I liked him so much, and that night, I went to bed wondering if he liked me too. And then one night, he asked if he could read me a bedtime story. Even though I was 16, he said he'd always read to his daughter, and he missed it. So I said sure he could, and then, you won't believe it, he fell asleep next to me, in my bed! I barely slept a wink that night. I just watched him as he slept, and had to stop myself from reaching out to stroke his hair. I so badly wanted to tell him how I felt. But for now, this was enough. Just being close to him and getting to have a peaceful life together. Little did I know that our peace was about to be disrupted. A woman moved in next door to us. Her name was Rosa, and she was seriously gorgeous. After she'd unpacked, we went over to say hi, and straight away, I regretted it. She immediately started flirting with James, even reaching out and stroking his arm as she said, Oh my, look at those muscles. I'll need your help setting up my kitchen, if you don't mind. James just laughed and said he'd be happy to help. As we walked away, I looked back and saw Rosa checking out James, and I knew she was going to be trouble. And sure enough, after that first meeting, she kept popping up. The next day, she asked James to help her fix a light bulb, and then a few days later, she came over with a plate of muffins to thank him. She never really spoke to me. She only had eyes for James, and I didn't like it one bit. Was she trying to steal him from me? The more she hung around, the more jealous I became. Everything had been perfect until she turned up, and now I was so scared James would fall for her and I'd be all alone again. My feelings were becoming so intense, so I decided there was only one thing for it. I had to tell him how I felt. I was pretty sure he had feelings for me too. I had to act quick, before Rosa made a move. 